Okay, one warning, here we go. 6059, here we go. Good afternoon, Professor. Good afternoon, Savannah. All right. Good hi. afternoon. Yeah. Uh, yes. Hello, Jose. Uh, yes. You could want to say hi from the background. Hello. And my son says hello. Oh, and my board says goodbye. Hello, Carol. Hello, Jose. My son just said hello right as my board said goodbye. Hang on one second. I'm sorry. Hold on. But he. Oh, good afternoon. Okay, I'll do the chat in a second. Oh, my board. What? God, my board is more bored than you guys. Hold on. I don't even know why. Okay, hold on. It's becoming more and more. Okay, there's the board again. Okay, and there's Kevin. Um, hold on. So, yes, I said hello, Jose. I see Caroline. Hello. Thank you for the avatar. Caitlin, hello, Amy's avatar. Hello, Kevin's avatar. Now I'm doing the chat. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Amanda. Good afternoon, Caitlin. Evan, good afternoon. Closed caption. Wait, there's Manuel. Manuel. Good afternoon, Evan. Good afternoon, Amy C. Good afternoon, which I don't have to say anymore, right? Because the other Amy's in the other class. Anyway, good afternoon, Jose. I said that because of the blah, blah, blah. Good afternoon, Sumaya. Good afternoon, Stephen. Hi, Yubin. Good afternoon, Rashman. Good afternoon, Kevin. I think, no, I have to say, I'm reading the, uh, my son is um, an active participant in, constructive criticism. Good afternoon, Erica. Okay, that's good. Oh, good afternoon, Emily. Awesome, awesome. Okay, wait, who did I miss? That's every, yes, yes. And why do I feel like I saw someone that I didn't write? Okay, good, good, good. Hey, oh. oh, thank you, direct chat person. Okay, that's funny. I appreciate it. Uh, good, I, you might keep it. Oh, what? Oh, there's two. Oh, wait. Thank you, other direct chat person. That's interesting. Wait a second. No, that was an accident. Oh, thank you. Did did I do two? To, okay, get, hang on. Is that definitely an accident? But did I? Does that mean I did the same number twice accidentally, or I literally gave you two today? Hang on. Okay. Well, there's. I can go public with this. I won't mention any names. But it's the same number. Okay. Wait, thank you. Somebody in the direct chat who shall remain nameless, but hopefully will submit for points for this. I'm going to open up a portal for people who are some, I'm going to definitely make a new portal for people requesting clarification or gently pointing out mistakes that I make or something or things such as this one. Okay, so someone in the direct chat is pointing out that I did something wrong about the game turns. Give me a second, let me fix it right now. That was definitely a mistake, thank you. Hang on, let's see what I did. Oh, let's see, with the game turns, I might've, oh, let's see, let's see. Sorry, sorry, and we will get rolling. But I actually really love it when people point this stuff out because it shows that we're paying, we're all in the same. Okay, game turns, game turns. Oh, oh, it's literally the same thing, oh. Wait a minute. Yes, that is very confusing. Wait, I skipped. Today is. Oh, and we didn't have a class. Oh, I see what I did. Okay, okay. Um... Right, because we didn't have class yesterday. Huh. So that means. All right. Uh, yes. Thank you. No, that's a mistake, but I kind of see why it, I confused myself because we are. Okay. Okay. So let's just make sure no one's turned that in. Okay. Okay, thank you, direct chat. Please submit that for participation points. But yes, all right, the game turn has now been fixed. <clears throat> Tonight's is called number seven because it's number seven because we didn't have um, a game turn yesterday. You did have, as you know, you know, you had that op that logistical three point opportunity and the opportunity to watch yesterday's video for eight extra points. Um, 
which we should talk about in a second, but okay. But hopefully the game turn is now fixed. Oh, you noticed that as well. Okay, thank you. So both of you in direct chat. Okay, I'm looking at direct chat now. Okay, yes, thank you both. Oh, and you just closed the conversational loop. So that's more points. Submit that for points. Okay, but this also is a good reminder. So I'm gonna go back um, now. Hopefully it's fixed now and Kevin is here. That's a good reminder that, let me say again, you know, we didn't have class yesterday but the video from the other section was posted. Most of you acknowledged for three points, you know, a few days ago that you knew that was going to happen and you acknowledged the arrangement and you got three points. And a number of you have now followed up and watched the video for yesterday and gotten eight more points. You know, we since we don't have class for the rest of the week, I, it, it, I don't remember what I made the deadline. Hello, good to see you. I don't remember what I made the deadline, but I'm happy to... I mean, the idea would be that you would have seen the video before today's class because it would sort of help to go in order, but I'll extend the deadline if I didn't already incorporate. I would, I really would encourage you all to watch the video from yesterday's class because it was thick. I mean, we did some serious mathematical material. We're trying, and it ties up all the math from questions four and five of homework 1B. Um, so it has to do with integrals. It has to do with the closed path integral of a conservative force that's both a physical concept that we've never talked about before and it's a mathematical concept that you may not have seen in a calculus class called a closed path integral is pretty important stuff and then we related it back to potential energy so as to finish up the concept of total mechanical energy conservation. So what I'm saying is please watch the video from yesterday because we're going to rely on that material a lot later in the semester. In fact, right now I'll extend the deadline to make it clear. So you get eight points for showing any evidence or summarizing any takeaways from that video. And some people have definitely done it and I and they got the points and I appreciate it. Okay, so I'm going to look. Yeah, technically. Yeah, five. I'm going to extend the deadline right now on that. <sighs> okay. And so I just did, and let me just be clear. Can you just give me a show of hands? If you, I, some of you, I know, I know I'm looking at your box right now. I know some of you already did that and got the points for it and actually provided very impressive summaries that really showed you really did watch the video. Can I just get a show of hands if you understand what I'm talking about and you understand that I just extended the deadline to watch that video? Thank, awesome, thank you, thank you. Oh, I like the clapping. Okay, great, great, awesome. Um. And, you know, it's like anything else. If it really comes to, great, thank you. And if it comes to, so I extend it to Friday at midnight. If you get to Friday, if you're really committed and you really are, you know, really committed to the idea that you're going to watch that video and stay on top of the class and get the points and you text me Friday and say, okay, I really am going to do this, but I really can't right now. Can I really do it over the week? Of course, if you just text me or whatever, we'll make an arrangement. It's fine. I'd much rather you just do this than not. But ideally you'd want to have done it by the, time we have our next class because otherwise it's going to all get confusing all right you understand all right that said i am going to i'm going to move on now in the sheet in the homework one oh uh, no let me back up also so homework two was posted right homework two pulls us along you know the homework is ahead of where we are discussing in lecture. The labs are ahead of what we're discussing in lecture. That's always the way it is in physics. You have to play around with stuff, figure out stuff, try stuff, and then you finally get clarification in the lecture. In the long term, I think that's really good for everybody, but in the short term, it certainly can be challenging and frustrating. I know that. Um, so, the, so the homework two, which is a big exploration of these math concepts that really are getting introduced have been introduced in the lab and really are going to get nailed down when we finally go over question nine from homework one homework two is not a joke it's not easy it's very mathy um any of you who have already made any kind of attempt on it on time have gotten a lot of points like the starter set of points um you still can get the rest of the points and much more detailed feedback once i see it actually get finished and thoroughly revised as per our discussions in class 
Therefore, even that also is being extended. If you notice, there's no new homework due for a while. Even homework two has been extended to be reassigned for next Monday or something like that. And I'll probably extend even further. We're going to finally start really laying down concepts in lecture that will really help you with homework two. And we won't assign homework three until we're up to it. So just keep doing what you're doing. If you haven't started yet, you still can. If you've already done some, you've gotten some points, but you'll get more points and more feedback soon. But here's the one thing I want to say to everybody, because one thing I am noticing, I know that you know that I know that you're being asked to try these things before we clarify them in lecture. That is the way it goes. So that's why you have infinite opportunity for infinite drafts and infinite revisions and why you can make mistakes at first and then go back. But one thing I want to keep encouraging you guys is don't leave things blank. Don't leave things blank. The whole purpose of the five-step method, the purpose of the five-step method for problem solving is it gives you something to do when you don't know what to do. Like, honestly, really. And this is the essence of physics and general science research that many of you want to be pursuing later on. In real research, we there is no road carved out for us before we get there. We're building the road as we travel it, right? We don't know what we're doing when we do original research, but we have to know what to do when we don't know what to do. And that's what we're practicing in this class. So what I'm saying is, I know the homework is hard before we discuss it, but in each one of the questions, even if you don't think you know how to get an answer, you, for each question that's on homework two, you can draw a diagram and you can keep referring to that diagram if you think it's the same diagram for all the questions. You can draw a diagram. You can make it, exp that's step one. You can make it explicit what the question's asking. That's step two. You can do that even if you don't fully know what to do with that question. And probably once you've written down step two, you probably have a high likelihood of being able to write down step three, some kind of general definition or principle that will somehow lead you toward a solution for that problem. And the truth of the matter is once you write down step three, you probably can start step four, et cetera, et cetera. Like each step, if you actually take it, points toward the next step, that's the idea. But even if you can't get through all the, all the steps and get to a final answer, what I'm really increasingly saying is, increasingly, we don't really have a justification for not starting something, even if we feel that we don't know how to finish it. Step one and step two is something everybody can do, even if you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and last point, and then I see there's something in the chat, or I thought there's something in the chat, but that's actually a dog, a dog who's not in the chat. Um, last point on this is, I'm saying make a diagram, even for homework two, which seems very mathy, and for which no diagram has been provided to you by me. There is no diagram in the question, but that's all the more reason that if you look at the question and you think it's somewhat abstract, you should start by providing a diagram. What kind of diagram? I don't know, maybe a cosine graph, for example. I think that would be relevant to a lot of the questions in homework, but something that labels the independent and dependent variable and the constants that are gonna be used in a solution. That's a habit, is knowing how to start something even if you don't feel you know how to finish it. Okay, enough said on that. So please bear that in mind. Anyway, there's no new homework besides homework two, it's just let's do another draft, another revision of homework two for Monday. Let's try to watch a video for Monday. Um, and all that said, I'm now gonna to continue to try to finally finish all of our, um, linear and nonlinear discussions of homework one. Question four and five, we're finally, you've been given answers, you've been given skeleton solutions for them. The, 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 the deep filling in of those skeleton solutions was done on the, were done on the video yesterday. So you'll watch that and you'll see how question four and question five finally got resolved, how we established total mechanical energy conservation. Um, for the mass spring system. So what I wanna do, so again, I'm gonna assume that once you've seen the video, you'll have a complete working knowledge of questions four and five. Um, now we're gonna start making our way to six, seven, eight, and nine. So wait, is the board still working? Yes, okay. 
what you see on the board right now are the equations that we're going to try to get to. Well, particularly the first equation on the board now is the punchline that we're going to try to get to by the time we open up question nine on homework 1B. Um, we're going to get there via question six, seven, and eight. Okay, so let's go to question six. I'm just going to change the view on the video. Um, okay, so I'm going to question six on homework 1B. Um, the questions six, seven, and eight are, are kind of the intuitive English implications of the mathematics that we established for total mechanical energy conservation um, in questions four and five. What, what we established in question four and five ultimately is this. is this. A conservative force is a force that does net zero work around any closed path. Okay, the takeaway from yesterday and, and from the prior class is that some forces, as they do work on you, Ultimately, oh, let me back up for a second and say, what we established two classes ago is when I do positive work on a system, I give kinetic energy to that system. Work is the transfer of energy. If I do positive five joules of work on a system, that is if I push it or pull it through a displacement such that I do five joules of positive work on that system, then I will necessarily increase its kinetic energy by five joules. It will get five joules of kinetic energy. Where did that kinetic energy come from? It comes from the fact that I will lose five joules of kinetic energy. To do work is to transfer energy. Energy is the commodity, work is the transaction, right? What is energy? It's the ability to do work. What is work? It's the transfer of energy. Is that a circle? Yes. But is it a meaningful circle? Yes. What we're saying in English is the bigger I am and the faster I am, the greater ability I have to knock into you, to push or pull you, and, th and thereby get you moving. The more I'm moving, the more I can move you. I move you. When I move you, I give you some of that ability. That's what we're saying, right? So work is the transfer of energy. What we established yesterday in the video is that some forces, when they're doing work, we know in advance that the work that they're gonna do over any closed path, any round trip, we know in advance that the total work they're gonna do over any closed path is zero. We know that whatever they're going to give you on your way out, they're going to take away on the way back. Or whatever they take away on the way out, they're going to give on the way back. Gravity is an example of that. If you throw something up, it's getting slower and slower as it goes up. We're doing work on it, negative MGH as it goes up. Why negative? Because the force of, I mean, gravity is doing work on it, negative MGH as it goes up. Why negative? Because while the object is being thrust up, when you throw something up, as it's moving up, its displacement is pointing up, but the force of gravity is pointing down. So they're in conflict, right? It's a negative times a positive yields a negative. So on the way up, gravity is doing negative MGH work on the object. It's removing kinetic energy from the object. The object's getting slower and slower. When it gets to the top and starts coming back down, it's now displacing down, but the force of gravity is still down. So now it's a negative times a negative, a positive. The force is in agreement with the displacement. So on the way back down, the work being done by gravity is in fact positive MGH, right? Because the force is in agreement with the displacement. So on the way back down, the work is MGH. The object is gaining energy, going faster and faster, and it'll gain back exactly what it lost on the way up. Friction does not work this way. Tension does not work this way. The normal force does not work this way, but gravity does and the spring force does. Forces that do that, 
that necessarily do net work zero over a closed path, that necessarily tra ultimately transfer zero energy over a closed path are called conservative forces. And what we are now saying is that any object that is acting under the influence only of conservative forces will thereby conserve total mechanical energy. The total mechanical energy will never change. Anytime the object seems to be losing kinetic energy under the presence of a conservative force, it's in fact, or we say, it's storing the energy as potential for later. It'll ultimately get back whatever it loses. Okay. I mean, it's a shorthand version of the video yesterday. So, so total mechanical energy is conserved for a system such as the mass on the spring. At any given place in the mass's motion, at any given position in space, the sum of its kinetic plus its potential energy, its total mechanical energy, will be the same as it is at any and every other space, right? That's what total mechanical energy conservation means. So question six, so in, in mathematical terms, what we said weeks ago and what we explained in more detail yesterday, in mathematical terms, that means the one half mv squared plus the one half kx squared at any one spot is equal to the one half mv squared plus the one half kx squared at any other spot. Okay. So for question six, when it asks, what is the next place that the velocity, the instantaneous speed of the object will again be zero? Like we know it started with zero speed. It started at position 15 centimeters from equilibrium. It started with zero speed and we, we let it go. And now it's oscillating back and forth, back and forth. But we're asking, when's the next time? Where is the next place that its speed will be zero again? And if you didn't do any work at all, but you just thought in your mind, like, oh, okay, I mean, I assume, I mean, unless this is a trick, I mean, if I had to go with my most probable guess, I kind of intuitively think it's going to be 15 centimeters on the other side. If you just thought, you're right. If you just intuitively thought, well, I assume it's going to be the same thing on the other side, you're absolutely right. If basically, if basically without using these words, you were thinking, I assume it's symmetric. I assume it's kind of like a mirror image on one side. Is it? Then you're totally right. Now, what I want to tell you is you're not right by accident. You're right rigorously because, in fact, this is the nature of mechanical energy conservation. What I'm saying is if you wanted to now do this problem out rigorously, it's like step one, there's my diagram. Step two, there's the question. Next time V equals zero, what's X, right? There's step two. Step three, what's the GDP? The GDP, what's the general definition or principle for this? You might think it's, well, duh. The general definition is like, duh. I mean, it's like obviously symmetric. Yeah, you're right. But like, why? Why? Because it conserves energy. It turns out that any system that that conserves, mecha yeah, that, that conserves mechanical energy. We, uh, yeah, so I am. I, I did, yeah. Any system that, can, that was fair. I mean, thank you for asking so politely. Um, any system that conserves mechanical energy, we can now say with certainty from here on in, is going to respect time symmetry. A system that conserves energy will be symmetric in time. I'm going to show you the math down here, but then I want to make, but the broader GB, GDP that we can use from now on is, this is an English truth. You can rely on it, that if a system remains constant in mechanical energy, it will remain symmetric in time. Okay, first of all, what do I mean mathematically? I mean, we're solving for the next X such that V equals zero. The X that we already know something about, the X where we already know V is zero is X naught, positive 15 centimeters from equilibrium. Right. So at the bottom of the board here, I've set it up one half mv squared plus one half kx squared at the unknown x equals one half mv squared plus one half kx squared at the known x, x naught. And I, after this, I could try to do that. My, I can move. Um, um, so you see at the bottom, one half mv squared plus one half kx squared equals one half mv squared plus one half kx naught squared. Right. Now, now let's now remember we're solving for x. Right, we're solving for the next x, and and again, I, I know that most of you probably know it's, or probably think 
correctly, then it's like negative 15. And I'm just showing you why mathematically it works out rigorously. Um, so we're solving for the X that's on the left-hand side. On the left-hand side, at the X that we're solving for, we know V is zero because that's the condition of the problem. Where is the X such that V equals zero? So I crossed out V equals zero. I crossed out that term. Now that's equal to what? That's equal to the total energy at the known spot, X naught. Well, at the known spot, at X naught, V is also zero. So I crossed that out. So now I have... What almost what if you're not careful, it looks redundant. I have one fkx squared on one side equals one fkx squared on the other. Oh, there goes my board, of course. I'll put it back in a second. But it looks like I have one fkx squared equals one fkx squared. It looks like there's nothing to solve there, but it's two different x's. The x on the left side is the x we're solving for. The x on the right side is the known one, positive 0.15. Right, hold on. Let me just get the board again. Right, so, so I can cross out everything else. I cross out the one half, you know, divide both sides by one half, divide both sides by K. So now we have X squared equals X naught squared, i.e. X squared equals 0.15 squared. That looks redundant, like, well, duh. I mean, X equals X, like what? But X squared equals 0.15 squared. That's a quadratic. What we're really saying is X squared equals 0.0225. There's two roots to that quadratic, right? It's like saying, it's like saying, what is the number such that it's square? What's the number such that it's square is 16? Well, four works, but negative four also works, right? Both of them, for both of them, it's true that if you square them, you get, six, okay, so you see my point. So there's two roots to this quadratic, yeah, po positive and negative 0.1. My board again, but you, you see, you all see my point mathematically. And, and again, maybe I'm dragging this out. I'm just trying to show you the energy conservation. I'm trying to show you that whatever intuitions you have about how it should just be a pattern, it should just be, you are right. But I want to nail down, those patterns aren't always right. Not everything is symmetric in life. Not everything is and patterned. But energy conservation. So from here on in, if we ever show that something truly is an energy conserver, oh yeah, we can rely on all these patterns that we just intuitively think, and they work mathematically. I'm putting the board back. So I'm saying from here on in, the board really fit. I'm saying from here on in, you can rely that for any heart energy conserver, any harmonic oscillator like the one we have here, there will be two places where the velocity is zero, where the instantaneous speed is zero. There will be two places, uh, that is, where the kinetic energy is zero. Those two places are the turning points, the, the endpoints of the motion. The two places where the kinetic energy is zero are necessarily the two places where the potential energy is a maximum. Okay, there it is. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of adding some detail to what I think you mostly already knew. But yes, the other, the next place where this thing will have a velocity of zero is negative 0.15. And from here on in, these two turning points of oscillation, these two places, these places that have the same value as what we first called the initial displacement from equilibrium, from here on in, we're noticing that they will become the maximum displacement from equilibrium. The initial place, assuming you start from zero speed, the initial place will become the two maxima places and, to, and the, two, the, the two places of maximum potential energy, minimum kinetic energy, and will from now on call those turning points the amplitude points. In other words, introducing a word you've heard a million times in your life, you just want to nail down. Amplitude from here on means maximum displacement from equilibrium. Amplitude means maximum displacement from equilibrium. A, a point of amplitude is a point of minimum kinetic energy, maximum potential energy. It is thereby a turning point, okay? So just vocabulary there. Right, so that's, so that's it. So the answer to question six is negative 0.15 meters. Okay, that's question six. Now let's go to question seven. Having dragged out question six, like to the ends of the earth like that. Oh, oh wait, I'm sorry. I, I got to say, wait, wait, so there's one other thing I have to say about question six. I'm sitting, mm, do I? 
Yeah, uh, very briefly. What I'm trying to show in question six is that the mathematics, the algebra of energy conservation do support and um, they do support your intuition about energy conservation. And what do I think that intuition is? I think that intuition is that it would be symmetric. What I'm trying to specify now is not all things in life are symmetric, but energy conservers are symmetric. And often if you see a certain kind of symmetry in a system that probably indicates that it's conserving energy. When I say that an energy conserving system is symmetric in time, here's a very specific example of what I mean. What I mean is if you take a system that conserves energy, such as a, a ball under the influence of gravity, and you throw that ball up and let it come down, the way up is a mirror image of the way down, right? Specifically meaning yeah. the rate at which the ball loses speed on the way up is precisely identical to the rate at which the ball gains speed on the way down, right? And if you were to take a movie of the ball going up and next to every position that the ball attained in the movie, if you were to put a little indicator of its speed, if you had a little digital speedometer next to the ball, that read out at speed, you would notice that with any position that the ball attained on the way up, whatever its corresponding speed was, that would be the exact same as whatever the corresponding speed is indicated for any position on the way down, right? So much so, that is so true, that if you just excerpted a little bit of that motion, say I just dropped a ball, all right, I just dropped a ball, I just did one part of that round trip, one leg of that round trip and I just dropped the ball and you, and I took a movie of the ball on its way down, maybe even a movie that had next to it a readout of the ball's speeds, you know, at intervals as it fell down. If I took a movie and then went up to someone and said, okay, I'm gonna show you a movie of a ball that was dropping, or I mean a ball that was in the air under the influence of gravity, I might show you the exact movie or I might play the movie backwards and I want you to guess what actually happened, right? Like I took a movie of a ball falling down. I take a movie of a ball falling down. And then I go up to a contestant and say, you have to figure out whether I'm showing you this movie forwards or backwards. Like you have to look at the movie and see what actually happened. And the only, and i.e., you have to determine what could have actually been possible in nature according to the laws of physics. Well, I submit to you that... My son says physics is also stupid, which is okay, which is a perspective. It's all a matter of perspective. But here's the thing. I think even if my son did that contest to me, and I like to think that I know physics, right? But if he did that contest to me, if he showed me a movie of a ball and he, and, and he said, you have to guess whether the ball was actually falling down or whether the ball was going up, watch this movie and tell me if I'm playing you the actual movie or whether I contrived the movie backwards, there's no way I could tell because the down motion precisely resembles the up motion in terms of all of the data. And every, like, in other words, things can go up. You throw something up, it can go up. It's just that when it goes up, it slows down at a certain rate and things can fall down and they speed up when they fall down. And you, and the way one happens is a perfect mirror image of the other. There's no way to know which one actually happened if you showed a movie backwards of it. And you might say, well, isn't that always true in life? Like, duh, what are you even saying, Yaverbaum? Oh, good question. But no, it's not always that way in life. Like, for example, if I put a cup of coffee on the table, a hot cup of coffee or a hot cup of soup, and there's steam rising out of that cup. Of okay, I'll just do coffee as an example. If I put a hot cup of coffee on the table and there's steam rising out of that coffee, and I take a movie of that, right? Or similarly, there's a car going down the highway, and I take a movie of the car going down the, the road, and there's like, you know, a smoke coming out of the exhaust pipe from the car, because like there always is with cars, right? Or or I take a movie of like a, a, um, a hockey puck being slid along super, super rough sandpaper or super, super rough wood and, and, um, and, and get the movie camera close enough that I can see a, like a little bit of sparks or a little bit of smoke or, or dust coming out um, as the puck slides along the rough, rough surface. What I submit to you is in all of those cases, 
if you show the movie backwards to someone, they would know it was a backwards movie. They, in other words, if I show you a movie of a cup of coffee on a table, but I play it backwards, you'll see steam being sucked back into the hot cup of coffee, right? You'd see steam coming from all over the room, narrowing itself into a little column and like just, and disappearing, stinking into the coffee. Or if I showed you a movie of a car going back, like I took a movie of a car going on the highway, but I played it backwards for you, you would see smoke being sucked back into an exhaust pipe of a car. And that never happens. That violates the laws of physics. That is impossible so, or empirically impossible. Same thing with steam being sucked into a cup of coffee. Doesn't happen. You would know it was backwards. Those are all examples of systems that don't conserve energy. At least they don't conserve mechanical energy. In all those systems, mechanical energy is being converted to uh, some other form, thermal energy. And that process is not reversible or symmetric in time the way a mechanical energy conservation is. This is important. You're going to see how this is going to play itself out more and more with oscillations for the rest of the semester. Bottom line, a system that conserves mechanical energy is symmetric in time. A system that does not conserve mechanical energy is not symmetric in time. Okay, that's a, it's, it's actually a powerful distinction in physics. Okay, so that's that. Question seven, having said all of that, question seven, speaking of symmetry, then asks, question seven asks, assuming that the, the amount of friction is too small to make a measurable difference, how many indistinguishable cycles can this mass complete until it's incapable of moving? Okay, I'm going to do this one quickly. I'm not doing the five-step method. I'm going to save a little time and just tell you that if you followed the five-step method for the last question, you will know that the answer to this question is infinity. And you will have presumably intuitively realize that even without all this discussion, if energy is really being conserved, this thing is going to go on forever, right? Because every time it stops, according to energy conservation, it should be at a maximum amplitude point, like 0.15 or negative 0.15. Every time it stops, it should be one of those points. And every time it's at one of those points, it has enough energy to get back to the other point. So as long as energy is conserved, this thing is going to keep going forever. Is it super realistic for just a dumb little spring in a dumb little lab to perfectly conserve energy to this extent? No, it's not that realistic for a dumb little spring in a dumb little lab to do that. But it is realistic for a very, very long spring in a very controlled lab to effectively do this. And I just want to point out the answer to seven is infinity. That is just as realistic or unrealistic as any of the numerical answers that you got for question four, five, and six. Like, don't think that those answers are more realistic just because they're mathematically precise. They are all assuming that energy is being conserved here. So the answer to seven is infinity. All right, now, let me see if there's, oh, something in the chat. I'm sorry, I apologize. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. So some, uh, and that is true. My son points out that infinity is technically not a number. And touche, absolutely. He should submit that for class participation. He's totally right. It is not a number. Uh, but it is, uh, but it, it's an acceptable answer to this question, as is another one that someone just put in a direct chat. They wrote, someone who shall remain nameless, um, wrote for seven that it would not stop moving. Is that an acceptable answer? Absolutely. Yes. That is the English. And infinity is English for, yes. The thing is going to keep on going. I totally, yes. So my son and the direct chat person are unified in everybody's acceptance of this. Oh, thank you. Okay, awesome. Um, all right, now these get okay. And other members of my family apparently are all, we've all learned something in physics today. Okay, we're now, yeah, okay, except, right, except that I'm pushing my luck. All right, now question eight gets dicey. I have no idea what my whole family is going to do with this one. I think the dog is going to participate in question eight now. All right. All right. Question eight. Um, question eight. Okay. Yeah. No, question eight takes some thought. All right. We're going to try to do more close to the step method for question eight. Question eight. I've redrawn the diagram, right? I mean, it's a shortened version of the same diagram. We're looking at over and over again. We've got the mass on the spring. On the right side, the left side of the spring is attached to the wall. The spring has a stiffness of K. The mass is initially stretched. Yes. 
<laughs> oh my God. My son just asked, is this what I do for seven hours a day? And yes, we're all kind of saddened and embarrassed to realize that the answer is yes. And seven is putting it mildly. Um, yeah, but it's not like I do it for seven hours a day for every day uh, for 30 years. Oh, wait. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, no, the truly sad thing is that I still find it interesting. So um, um, what we're asking a question... All right. What we're asking in question eight, we're focusing our attention on just now the first quarter of a cycle. Like we think this thing is going to, I'm arguing this thing is going to cycle back and forth forever symmetrically and really symmetrically, right? Like it's going to, it's going to come in while it's speeding up, speeding up. Then it's going to slow down, slow down. Then it's going to speed up, speed up, speed up. Then it's going to slow down, slow down. Like it's going to continue this cyclical pattern of positions, this cyclical pattern of speeds, and perhaps this cyclical pattern of other rates of change as well. That's what we want to investigate now. But so far, we see there's a cyclical pattern of where the thing is as a function of time. We're going to just focus our concern on the first portion of the, the first quarter of one cycle, just the part where it starts at x naught and is coming into x equals zero, right? Where it starts at 15 centimeters and is coming into zero centimeters. We're gonna now ask what is happening to the magnitude of the following rates of change, right? That's what we ask in question eight. We're asking about just magnitude. We do, um, um, and we're asking, does the magnitude increase, decrease, or remain the same for each of the following possible measurements, right? Um, so turn it to page. Okay. So let's look first at the magnitude of velocity. Now there happens to be an English word for this, right? The, and it's called speed. So we're just looking at the speed right now. We want to know from X naught to zero, does the speed increase, decrease, or remain the same? Okay. This is not meant to be a trick question. This is meant to set up a contrast. So hopefully it's not too surprising or confusing to say, oh, well, look, the speed started at zero and it in, and it went all the way to 3.87 meters per second, we found out in question four. So it seems, okay, so we found out, it seems to me somewhat straightforwardly that the speed is increasing as the thing comes in, right? It is. I mean, the spring is pulling it from rest toward equilibrium, the, the mass is getting faster and faster as it comes in from uh, the amplitude point to the equilibrium point, the speed is increasing. Note speed, or at least speed is the magnitude of velocity. Velocity is defined to be the first derivative of position with respect to time, right? It's the instantaneous rate of change of position with respect to time. Okay. So that's increase is the answer. So now we're going to the next derivative. We're looking at derivatives of position with respect to time. So the next one is, so acceleration. The object is clearly accelerating. I mean, it's getting faster and faster. So it does have an acceleration. And in fact, we already computed the acceleration at various points. Why does it have an acceleration? Because it's being pulled by the force of the spring, F equals MA. So it's being pulled, so it's accelerating. We found out that the acceleration at X naught was, was negative 100 meters per second squared. Now, negative just means that it's going to the left. Don't let the negative throw you. Negative just means it's going to the left. It is speeding up at that point by 100 meters per second squared, um, but in the leftward direction. Now, this question is asking us only to focus on magnitude, so I don't even care about that negative sign. I just know that at the beginning, it has a really high rate of acceleration. It's being pulled really hard by the spring. It has a lot of potential energy due to the spring. It's, it's, a, it's rapidly raising its speed from zero to something like in, much higher. But as it comes in, remember, it's moving and it's moving in. The spring is pulling less and less intensely. By the time it gets all the way to the equilibrium position, it has a huge amount of speed, but at the equilibrium position, it has no acceleration. The net force is zero. The spring at that moment is not pulling it anymore. It's where it wants to be. Now, granted, 
It has a lot of speed. It's going to keep moving, but not because the spring is pulling it. In fact, from the moment it starts moving out of the equilibrium, the spring is going to start pushing it back the other way. It's not being pulled anymore at the moment of equilibrium. It's only going, so it's not accelerating anymore. It's only going because it already has built up all this speed, this 3.87 meters per second worth. At the equilibrium, by definition of equilibrium, the acceleration is zero. That means the change in the speed instantaneously is nothing. That's why if we were to just to place the mass at equilibrium, if we were to place it there and give it a speed of zero, then it wouldn't change that speed. It would sit there, right? Its change is zero. So the acceleration went from a magnitude of 100 meters per second squared to zero meters per second squared. The acceleration decreased on the way in. The second derivative of position with respect to time decreased. Let, now hold that thought for a minute or pause. Make sure, in fact, I'm going to change the view for a second. I want to, this is not a trivial point. This is totally not a trick. It's not a trick, but it is tricky. It's not wrong, but it is unusual. It didn't, all, it didn't always happen last semester. Like, just to be clear, we're saying that something is speeding up, but the rate at which it's speeding up is going down. It's getting faster and faster, but by smaller and smaller increments. It's like if I had a pile of money and I kept adding to that pile, the pile would keep growing. But imagine that first I add a dollar and then I add 99 cents and then I add 98 cents and then I add 97 cents, right? The pile would keep getting higher, but by a lesser and lesser amount. That's what's happening here to the speed. The speed is going up, the acceleration is going down. It's not a contradiction. Just raise your electronic hand if you're with me so far, if that's okay. Okay, awesome, awesome. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Savannah. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Mackenzie. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Evan. Awesome. And you're, by the way, you're allowed to admit in the direct chat if that's not okay. Because I know in my heart that that, that exact idea is only becomes okay once it becomes okay. It's not okay for a while. And if it's never not okay, then you're skipping a beat. <laughs> yeah, it, it requires a little bit of thought to actually, okay, but I'm gonna go on. All right, but cool. Then I'm gonna go to the next one now. Now I'm gonna, well, yeah, oh, okay. I'm gonna go to jerk. Oh, oh Savannah, I'm sorry, Savannah, question? Or you're just still raising your hand from? No, sorry, that's just from before. Oh, okay, okay, great. but you're good, okay, thank you. And, and by the way, she totally, she just triple dip, triple dip, yo. She just got participation for raising her hand, plus she just used her voice. She, she could totally submit into the voice portal now for points. Okay, my son's like, whatever, yo. Okay, but yeah, Savannah, please give yourself many, many points. Thank you. Um, all right. Oh, my son says you should get 50 points. Okay, that's more than the she did. Okay, I'll consider that. Um, um, okay. So we just did first derivative with respect to, I mean, first derivative of position with respect to time. Then we did second derivative of position with respect to time. Now we're about to look at the third derivative with respect to time, the third derivative of position with respect to time. That's something we have not looked at in physics prior to this. You, in math, you might've thought about it maybe, but in physics, we haven't before. Um, and I wanna take a quick sidebar when we look at the third derivative, if you look at the second derivative acceleration, it is d2x over dt squared. I just want to acknowledge that that notation is perhaps a little confusing at first. I want to acknowledge that when I used to see that notation, d2x over dt squared, the fact that the two is in the middle of the numerator, but the other two was at the end of the denominator, like I found at best, super annoying. At best, super annoying. What I think I really did half consciously with that notation was because it seems so random and weird and unbalanced, it just seems so not logical that they put the two in one place in the numerator and they put it in a different place in the denominator. I have to admit that I think over time, me, seeing that notation over and over again was one of those things that led me half consciously to just decide that most math was just some arbitrary weird set of decisions that weird math people made that didn't like have any 
real coherence or bear any relation to like intuitively how I would think about things. It just was another reason for me to just assume that math was something I was supposed to just accept and memorize and just get right on the test. And it made me fuzz out any kind of desire to actually think that the stuff might actually make sense. In other words, it didn't help me trust notation when I saw that. But I'm here to tell you that the notation is really powerful. And the notation really not only makes sense, but can really help you do this difficult math. Even that notation that looks weird, that I don't remember, and I'm sure someone explained it to me and I just didn't hear it. But I just take a quick sidebar here on page six to show you, well, to, to, to show you why that notation is that notation. Why is it like that for this reason? Because derivatives are not multiplications. When you take the derivative of something, you're not multiplying. Let me back up and say this more strongly. A function is something that you do to a number. A function is, num is a rule or a mapping or a box where you put a number in and you get a different number out. That's what a function is. Number in, number out. An operation, in contrast, an operation such as take the derivative of, or take the integral of, an operation is not something you do to a number. An operation is something you do to a function. A function is number in, number out. An operation is function in, function out. And so when we take, when we look at the first, so go on the next page, here's why that notation is funky like that. When we do look at velocity, velocity is, the rate of change with respect to time of position. It's something we're doing to the position function. We're looking at how it changes with respect to time. So V is the DDT of X. It's not D times X over D times T. It's DDT of X. Therefore, A, the derivative of that, is just that, the derivative of that. A, acceleration, is the derivative with respect to time of the derivative with respect to time of x. It's the d dt of dx over dt. So if you look at it that way, if you look at the third line of this sheet, it's d2x over dt squared for that reason. Because we're trying to show, uh, if we wrote it the way you would, I would have thought would have made sense, if we wrote it as dx2 over dt2 or d2x over d, then it would, then it looks like a fraction being multiplied by another fraction. That's not what it is. It's a rate being applied to another rate. Okay, so that's a, and that's just a little plug. That's just a little sidebar or public service announcement to say, honestly, this notation actually is constructed for a reason. There is always some coherence to this notation. And if you just assume that going in and take another extra minute, anytime you see notation that doesn't make sense, to try to unpack it and see how it might make sense, it actually enables you to use the notation and figure out harder things better in the future. Okay, that said, we're now going to look at what is the third derivative of position with respect to time doing in this mass spring system? We're looking at d3x over dt3. This happens to be called jerk, like the guy at the front of the Zoom classroom. But like velocity is the first derivative of position with respect to time. Acceleration is the derivative of that. The second derivative of position with respect to time. Jerk is the third derivative of position with respect to time. We want to know, is it increasing, decreasing, or remaining constant? Well, up to, okay, we've never asked this question before. Honestly, in most examples we had in physics from physics one, the reason we never asked this is because usually the jerk was sitting in the front of the Zoom classroom yelling at the top of his lungs. No, usually the jerk was zero. We didn't look at it because it usually had a value of zero because the acceleration was usually constant. It, right? If the position is constant, then the velocity is zero. If the velocity is constant, then the acceleration is zero. If the acceleration is constant, which it usually was last semester, then the jerk would be zero. Right? When a function is constant, its derivative is zero. Here, the acceleration is the most explicitly not constant. So there is some kind of jerk here. There is a third derivative. How can we possibly know whether it's going up or going down or remaining constant? 
Well, I think the, our best possibility is, if we, is to look to see if there's any pattern. Is there a pattern? How can I know if there's a pattern? I only have two items so far. I have the velocity and I have the acceleration. All I have is the first derivative and the second derivative. How can I possibly find a pattern? Why don't I go back to the original function? Why don't I go back to the original function? What is the original function? The original function is position as a function of time. Like, let's back up and look at, in other words, the zeroth derivative. The zeroth derivative of position with respect to time is just that, the position. What did this mass do? Oops, someone's here. I'm sorry. What did this mass do? It started at 15 centimeters from the equilibrium position, at positive 15. And it started moving in towards zero. So its position was going from positive 15 to zero. Its position was decreasing. It was getting less and less, right? And that's not meant to be a trick. I'm just looking at the example to set up a pattern. So now let's stand back and look. Position was decreasing. Oh, sorry, so the function was decreasing. The first derivative velocity was increasing. The second derivative acceleration was decreasing. So I submit to you, I ask you, and I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna ask for this in the direct chat and I'll repeat the question. But I want to ask you what the answer is. What is the jerk doing based on what we just said? Is it increasing, decreasing, or remaining constant? Was it? Okay, wait, uh, hold on, wait, wait, hold on. One second. Um, wait, yeah, I, I hear you. Uh -oh, hold on, uh, hold on. Wait, I have, wait, hold on. Wait, just, okay. This is a croissant that has chocolate in it. How about that? Show them, show them. Is it, is it all right? Okay, sorry. Oh, oh, good. Oh, and he went for the public. Wait, okay. I'm saying good. I'm not saying it's the right answer or not. I'm, I'm just so psyched that someone put in an answer and he also just joined, which is kind of amazing. Um, I'm not saying whether he's right or wrong, but I'm totally, I am totally saying thank you for, he totally heard my question. Thank you for putting an answer at all. Okay. And now I'm going to say to all of you, and I'm going to repeat the question because I want to gather us all in here. If this is the last thing we do, and it might be, I'm going to repeat the, the question is, Question C, I mean, part C of question eight of homework 1B. And the question is, and I'm seeing that people are coming in the chat, and I'm going to respond to all the chats in a minute. And in fact, even, even Douglas, who went, well, yeah, I'm going to respond into the direct chats to everybody in a minute. I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to start typing in a second. I'm going to ask you all to do this. So I'm repeating. So I'm glad. I see you guys are great, great, great. I'm saying we want to know what the third derivative of position with respect to time is doing. And the our only bait, and it might've been hard to think about when you were doing this for homework, but I'm saying right now, the way to think of it is look at the pattern. The position, the, the zeroth derivative is going down. The first derivative is going up. The second derivative is going down. I'll say it one more time. The zeroth derivative is going down. The first derivative is going up. The second derivative is going down. So I'm asking you all, please, in the direct chat, four points. Tell me what the third derivative is doing. And even if you get it wrong, it's great, but I want something. The choices are increase, decrease, remain the same. And I'm going to pause and respond to everybody in the direct chat right now, including the person who went public, which I totally appreciate and I have no problem with, but I want to, okay. Hold on. Okay, so I'm just bear with me. I'm going to I'm going to respond to everybody in the direct chat, at least. Some.
You sure you don't want it? I said it was about 20. Why Um, I think that's it. I'm just making sure that I've responded to everybody who's. Okay, I just ordered the pizza. I mean, they're going to deliver it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I think, I think, well, I can't say that, but um, okay. So first of all, again, thank you all for participating. That was many of you. I did And <laughs> you most certainly did. Um, thank you for participating. It helps a lot. No, it it does also remind me if I, I know how tough this is on Zoom and all of that. Um, and mo so so and the truth is, and yes, with a little bit of thought, I think just about every single one of you that did participate eventually got to the right answer, which is increasing. I'm saying based on this pattern, if the zeroth derivative was going down and the first derivative was going up and the second derivative is going down, I think from that we might infer that the third derivative is in fact, oh, sorry, is in fact going up. Now, this isn't an ironclad proof. It's an inference or a conjecture. But what we're inferring is that nothing discontinuous is occurring. In other words, we're assuming that there is a pattern. We're assuming that there's a certain smoothness or continuity to these cycles. But you see, that's exactly what we really kind of established with mechanical energy conservation. Like what we're really saying is this thing is going back and forth smoothly in position. 
back and forth. What do I mean by smoothly? I mean, yes, it's going back and forth, but it's not a cartoon, right? It's not going forward at some constant speed and then stopping instantaneously on a dime. Like it's not going five miles an hour, five miles an hour, and then going and suddenly in no time at all going zero miles an hour. And then in no time at all going negative five miles an hour and going back the other way. Like, first of all, we're not saying that it's doing that. Second of all, it's really hard to imagine how something in nature could do that. What we're saying is it's going back and forth smoothly because not only are it's, because in order for its positions to go back and forth forever smoothly, its velocities must be going back and forth forever smoothly. By smoothly, I mean continuously. I mean, it, there, it's not jumping values, right? So if it's going to turn around, if it's going to turn around it, it's, if it's going to get from positive velocities to zero to negative velocities, what we're believing is it must do so by passing all the intervening values. It, it goes like zero to one to two to three to 3.87, back down to three to two, and all the values in between. It's smoothly, if, if its positions are going negative and then positive, its velocities are similarly going positive and then negative and passing through all. And in order, for, in, in order for its velocities to do that, its accelerations must be doing that. One other, you might remember the problem big old duck from physics 203. It's very much like that. Remember that big old duck was something that was traveling to the left. Eventually it slowed down and to zero and started traveling to the right. How did it do that? Because the entire time it had acceleration pointing to the right, right? The only way you eventually slow down to zero and start coming back to the right is if your acceleration is in conflict with your initial velocity, right? Ex velocity is what you're doing now. Acceleration is the way you're changing your velocity to some value later. If your velocities are going to go from positive to negative, that must mean they at first have a negative acceleration. But if the accelerations are going to change smoothly, then they must have a jerk that's pulling them along. In other words, for each derivative to change its sign, it must be under the presence of a higher derivative of an alternate sign. So it seems like, so if this thing is going back and forth smoothly and we don't see any jump in any position and we don't see any jump in any velocity, then we, there can't be any jump in acceleration or any jump in, in jerk or any of the higher derivatives. So it seems like this simple motion of back, forth, back and forth in space is in fact embodying a back and forth that is taking place in an infinite chain of derivatives. This, unlike any motion we studied in first semester, when we studied free fall, we said, okay, positions are changing, so there's a velocity. Velocities are changing, so there's an acceleration. But the velocities are changing in a constant way. When something falls, we said that something is getting faster and faster, always by 9.8 meters per second every second. So something that falls has a change in position. It has a velocity. It has a change in velocity. It has an acceleration. But that's it. The buck stopped there all the remaining rates of change that you could conceive of were zero. This is an infinite cycle of, of infinite derivatives, all in this simple package of f equals negative kx. It's why we're spending so much time on it. It's a simple package, but there's an enormous amount going on inside that package. Actually, there's an infinite amount going on inside that package. Okay, so when we... When we finally ask the seemingly simple question in question nine, in question nine now, which we have seven minutes left, question nine asks the seemingly simple question, given that f equals negative kx, what is x when t is one? It asks, where is the mass at one second? Well, really in broader terms, it's just asking, hey, what is yeah. Now. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on a second. Ninety percent. It ends at four twenty. Um, it's in broader terms. It's asking what is x as a function of time, right? I keep talking about this position function x. I keep talking about 
how X is depending on time. What really question nine is asking is straightforwardly, is what is that function, dude? I mean, is it X equals one half AT squared? No, it's not. X equals one half AT squared assumes a constant acceleration. We don't have a constant acceleration here. We have some relationship between position and time that somehow captures an infinite chain of derivatives. It's somehow it's a function that is infinitely differentiable. Um, so it's asking what is X as a function of time? Everything we've done up until this question on the sheet has all uh, used energy conservation to relate speed to position. We're now finally asking to relate position to time. It should be a very straightforward, fair qu physics question. You name the time, I name the space. It should be very straightforward. And we have this really simple statement, F equals negative KX. So let's break down the simple statement and, and see. It turns out it's simple, but it's not easy. F equals negative KX, Hooke's law. All right, we also have Newton's second law, F net equals MA. So we know, we know in general, all the forces acting on an object accelerate that object. There's only one force acting on this object, the spring force. So the spring force produces MA. Negative KX equals MA, as it says on the sheet, right? Okay, negative KX equals MA. Now, A, we've been saying, this entire class, A, by definition, is the second derivative of X with respect to T, right? A is D2X DT squared. So I'm substituting that in for A. So what I have here is negative KX equals M D2X DT squared. I divide both sides by M just to isolate, just to isolate the uh, X. So I have D2X over DT squared equals negative KM times X. On the one hand, Right, I, all I did was put together Hooke's law and Newton's second law. On the one hand, this seems like great progress. I mean, this is great progress and it seems very helpful because we're looking for X as a function of T. So now I have a statement at the bottom of the page that has only two variables in it, X and T. X is the dependent variable, T is the independent variable. Everything else in that statement is a constant. I mean, to wit, K and M. So the good news is, I, I'm down to a statement that just relates to two variables I'm trying to relate. The bad news is it is not a final answer. That thing at the bottom of the page doesn't tell me how to plug in T and, and produce X. What it's saying at the bottom is that the rate of change of the rate of change of X with respect to T is some function of X. Now that is simple, but it is not easy. What that statement is saying at the bottom is, it's saying, it, it, it's saying, it's asserting something ultimately known as feedback. It's saying something very self-referential. It's saying, oh, you want to know where the mass is at a certain time? No problem. I'm a physicist. I can tell you where the mass is at a certain time. I do that in physics all the time. All I need to know is what's the acceleration of the mass, right? I've got all my equations from first semester. I can tell you where something is as long as you tell me the acceleration. But then this statement is saying, oh, oh, you want to know the acceleration? Sure. All you need to know is where it is, right? That's what this statement's saying. It's saying the acceleration is a function of position. But position is the thing that we want to know as a function of time. So it's saying, if you want to know where, you want to know where it is, you need to know the acceleration, but you want to know the acceleration, you need to know where it is. That's what it's saying. That's true, but it's kind of crazy, right? Now you might even say, if you've been following all the calculus, and I know we have two minutes, you might even say, well, if it's a derivative of a derivative, can't we like just go backwards and take integrals? Really good instinct if you're saying, and ultimately we will do something like that. But the trickiness here is that the rate of change of the rate of change of X with respect to T is being expressed as a function, not of T, but of X itself. The fact that the right side has an X rather than a T, the fact that the right side invokes the dependent variable rather than the independent variable means that this thing isn't just an equation with derivatives in it. This is what's known as a differential equation. It relates a derivative to the dependent variable. It relates effect, it relates output to output, 
rather than to input. It relates effect to effect rather than to cause. We need some function. It's saying, and we have one minute left. We, what X is, is some function such that when you take two derivatives of it, with some function that if you take the derivative of the derivative of the function, you get back the original function times a negative sign times a constant. What, what kind of function possibly does that? And this is where we'll end for now and then we'll really explain this and unpack this on Monday. But uh, one function I know is cosine. If you take the derivative of cosine, you get negative sine. If you take the derivative of negative sine, you get negative cosine. And if, if there's something stuck in there before the T, after the cosine, and forces you to do chain rule, if you check it, if you take the derivative of the derivative of this cosine function, you get negative K over M, X naught cosine of that. You get back negative times K over M times the original function. That function works. It satisfies the differential equation that we just landed on due to Hooke's law. The answer to question nine is 0.116. Do I feel that I have fully explained this now? Not at all. We're going to unpack this much more on Monday. I'm saying that this function works because if you differentiate it twice, you get what you're supposed to. How did I get this function? That's what I'll explain to you on Monday. But you can check that this works by taking two derivatives of it and seeing that it gets you back itself times k over m times negative one. And so if you plug in one into this it will and, all, and plug in all the constants, the x that it'll spit out is 0.116 meters. That's the answer to question nine. We will explore that a lot more deeply on Monday. Thank you for being so, so patient. I'll hang out for one second if there are questions, but I do have another class right after this. So um, I'll post everything. Thank you for being so patient. Have a great rest of the week. Have a good day. Yes, thank you. Bye, great... Professor. Thank you. Bye. Right, thank you. Have so a good much. day. You too. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Good job. Thank you. Bye. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Awesome. I'm. Have a good day. Yes.